Hello, this is Catherine. Welcome to Double Little Kidney. In today's video, I'll show you why I think dialysis could become a thing of the past in just a matter of years. And I'm not saying this lightly. 2020 has been a year so full of bad news that they somehow forgot to tell you that there have been some very significant breakthroughs in the medical field. The implantable artificial kidney, for example, has made more progress in the past 12 months than in the past three years of production. There is even official notice now of where the human trials will take place. So yes, they're still en route to test the implantable artificial kidney in humans in 2020 like they announced. Now, there is more I want to talk about in today's video. There have been some really interesting development in the field of regenerative medicine that could really change things for kidney disease patients. Also, the Kidney Innovation Accelerator, Kidney X. This is a public-private partnership to find new treatments for kidney patients. More about this in a moment. So, a lot to talk about today, but I also want to answer some of your questions from my previous videos. Because you know, I always read your comments, all right? And there are some very interesting questions about the diet and supplements for kidney disease that caught my attention. So, I'm going to answer them today in the final part of this video. But first, let's start with the implantable artificial kidney. And I know that a lot of you guys want updates about what they're doing because, well, this is something that could really change the lives of a lot of chronic kidney disease and or dialysis patients because this Scientists are seriously trying to beat kidney disease and the shortage of organs for transplant. And I think they have never been so close to their goal. The most recent news. Locations for the human trials have been revealed. We have received official notice of where the human trials will take place, all right? And they're also collecting names and info of people wanting to join the trials. Now, if this doesn't sound amazing for you, well, I don't know what will. So, the human trials for the implantable artificial kidney will take place at institutions in California and Tennessee, okay? Specifically, the University of California, San Francisco and the Vanderbilt University. This is the big news. Also, according to the researchers from the Kidney Project, they will identify clinical trial partners nationally and across the world, okay? So these trials will not take place in the US only, at least this is the intention of the team. Now, the other interesting news is that you do not have to reside in those states to be considered for the trials. This is what I figured out from the latest communicates from the researchers of the Kini project, at least. Okay, I understand that not everyone knows what the implantable artificial kidney actually is and why I'm so excited to give you updates about it. The implantable artificial kidney developed by the Kini project team at the University of California, San Francisco is a device made to stop the need for dialysis and transplant. Yes, just that. No more dialysis. Because this device 
that will be eventually implanted inside the body of people in need of dialysis will be able to perform the same function of a human kidney. It will require just a minimally invasive surgery to be put in place, okay? And the other advantage will be that it wouldn't require immunosuppressant drugs, unlike what happens now with a kidney transplant. They already tested this in large animals last year. So this is not speculation. The artificial kidney should be able to work without any external power sources. So no batteries and no pumps. It will be powered by the human heart and it will be able to work for an indefinite amount of time. Also, it will be able to cleanse the blood efficiently without getting rid of the good stuff. So, this project is really revolutionary. It can change the lives of millions of people. So, Let's see what the current status of the project is. We are in preclinical studies at the present time. We are gathering more material safety data. Currently, we are focused on getting our first teeny human study approved. We have ongoing interactions with the FDA, which have ramped up over the past few months. Since November 2019, we have had three official meetings with the FDA to discuss elements of our application package for an investigational device exemption or IDE, which will allow us to begin clinical testing. This is what the team says about the current status. Now, what that means for you, the chronic kidney disease and or dialysis patient. Because what many people ask is, how can I be part of the trial? There is still no wait list for the human trials because they are still not approved by the FDA, but there is an interest list, a database that's being managed by the researchers of the Kini project. You can add your name and your info there and the researchers will be able to contact you when they receive clinical trial approval. I'm leaving a link in the description of this video to this list. You can give them your info if you want. Now, I'm following closely this project and I will give you an update here as soon as they start the human trials. So if you want me to keep you updated about the implantable artificial kidney, remember to subscribe and turn on notifications. But don't go away yet. There is more I want to show you today. As I was telling you in my video about the perfect treatment for kidney disease, dialysis as a procedure didn't change at all in the last 40 years. Now, this could be finally over thanks to an innovative partnership between the US Department of Health and Human Services and the American Society of Nephrology. They have created the Kidney Innovation Accelerator, Kidney X. This is a public-private partnership aim to create innovation to the chronic kidney disease community. What does this mean? Basically, they use prize competitions to accelerate the development of any significant new therapy, treatment, and innovation related to kidney disease. This way, if an organization or even an individual comes up with an interesting solution to one of the many problems connected to kidney disease, they could get found in the terms of a prize. They're basically giving investors and innovators a way to work together and create something new. This already brought us some interesting innovation. For example, one award was recently given for the proposal of creating a food label specific for kidney patients. So, this will be just like for foods labeled gluten-free, organic, all right? 
In the same way, having foods labeled as kidney friendly would really help people suffering from kidney disease. And this is genial. I mean, how many people here would want to know if what they're buying is safe for them without having to spend half an hour studying the ingredients? Yes, this one would be great. Another great idea that this system generated. This award was for the OneTrack Health mobile app, currently in beta testing. The idea is to give patients an app that could help them monitoring, tracking and sharing their lab results. Now, I don't know about you, but I will for sure follow the development of this app. Other prizes awarded by this partnership include creating a way to extend the life of a kidney removed for transplantation, creating kidney patient diet booklets, creating a device to monitor fluid levels in dialysis patients. These are just some of the advancements this partnership already generated. And while this doesn't sound as revolutionary as the artificial kidney, I'm still having a lot of expectations from Kidney X. Now, let's talk about regenerative medicine. Stem cells. This is really, really promising, in my opinion. The human kidney is the organ in the body with the greatest ability to regenerate its damaged cells. The kidney is in direct contact with toxins and other dangerous cores every day, so it needs to regenerate its damaged cells faster than any other organs, right? And this is not news but it's the reason why studies on stem cells are so promising. Now, the breakthrough I want to show you is a study to actually create an improvement of renal function by injecting amniotic fluid stem cells into a deceased kidney. This was done on animals, okay, but it's still a very significant milestone. In a controlled clinical setting, Researchers from Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine were able to improve the kidney function of a damaged kidney. Amniotic fluid stem cells were injected into a deceased kidney, directly resulting in improvement of renal function and reduced cellular damage according to measured waste levels after 70 days. The researchers have demonstrated that the cells could potentially help recover kidney function in those with kidney disease and even kidney failure. Basically, the amniotic stem cells appear to simply help the regeneration of damaged cells. Our outcomes indicate that this kind of stem cell therapy could possibly be used as an off-the-shelf cell that is universal and might provide an alternative therapeutic strategy for patients enduring this chronic and debilitating illness, said senior researcher Dr. James J. Yeo, professor of regenerative medicine. Now, Way more research is needed before this is going to be a reality for kidney disease patients, okay? But at one point, they will be able to simply inject you with stem cells and watch your kidneys repair themselves because this is what's happening in these animal studies. And let's consider that this is just one of the many possible applications of stem cell-based therapies, okay? This study uses human amniotic fluid derived stem cells, the mixture of stem cells that can be obtained from the fluid surrounding a fetus. But other researchers are using stem cells to create 3D printed kidneys for transplant. Researchers from the Wyss Institute at Harvard University have already done this, actually creating a 3D printed heart that can beat on its own 
and this is nothing short of amazing in my opinion now before i read the comments i want to answer today there is a personal thought i want to share with you about the topic of today's video we need constant motivation to keep doing the right thing and to keep taking care of ourselves and our health so what i want to tell you is make the hope for a new therapy your motivation to improve all right the possibility of a team of researchers developing a cure a treatment that really works to repair or replace the failing kidney should make you want to take more care of your kidneys because this is hope this may be the light at the end of the tunnel for so many people use this hope at your advantage okay time to answer your questions from my previous videos and i really want to be able to do this in all my videos you guys always ask very interesting questions the first one is from m ananta krishnan he's a regular of the comment section he asks Hi Catherine, I just came to know some rather disturbing information about baking soda. This info was shared in another forum by a board certified renal dietitian according to the renal dietitian. 650 mg strength sodium bicarbonate tablet contains 178 mg of pure sodium and worse one uh, teaspoon of baking soda contains 1200 mg of pure sodium. She says that unless prescribed by their renal physicians, it is not a good idea to take sodium bicarbonate or baking soda supplement as it causes a significant spike in the sodium levels of the CKD patients. If taken without the doctor's knowledge or consent, the unexplained spike in sodium level in the patient's blood test results leaves the renal physician wondering how such a marked increase could happen when the patient is put on a restricted salt diet. Okay, I've highlighted just part of the comment because there are other comments I want to read too. But this is a very important point. Now, I'm understanding that their main concern here is for people that start taking baking soda because they saw it on YouTube or on the internet. And for the doctors having hard times identifying the source of the excess of sodium. And yes, that's a concern too. Very valid point. Now, I say this in all my videos and I'll repeat it now even if I'm starting to sound like a broken record. If you are a kidney disease patient, don't take any supplement or home remedy without your doctor consent. Don't take herbal remedies either. Even significant changes in the foods you eat can be dangerous if you take any medication, right? Some drugs can have interactions even with food and there could be unforeseen side effects that you don't want to experience, trust me. And like you're saying, baking soda contains sodium. Baking soda is also called sodium bicarbonate. So it is sodium. It's a different form of sodium actually. And yes, if you take too much of it, it can raise your blood pressure. This is why getting the right dosage is important because like for every other supplement or even drug, you're not going to get benefits from it if you don't take it in the right dosage. This is especially important for baking soda because it's used to treat metabolic acidosis, a complication of CKD. And you got to be tested for that. Your doctor needs to know if the treatment is working. That's what doctor and tests are for. So yes, don't take baking soda without telling your doctor. 
Also, I usually recommend patients to make themselves a spreadsheet of all the pills and prescription drugs, but also herbal remedies and so on they're taking. Many patients have even three or more doctors. Maybe they have a dietitian, a chiropractor, and a, a naturopath. Don't know. So, when any doctor prescribes you something, you show them your pill diary and you ask them, is this safe? Are you sure it is safe? And this is very serious. I've seen people almost killed by doctors over prescribing without knowing what their patients were already taking. And obviously, your kidneys are the first in line. You don't want to risk them, okay? Now, another very interesting comment. It's about alkaline water. Got a lot of comments about this topic, actually. This one in particular is from Marlene Castillo. She asks, how about alkaline water? Can it help repair kidneys? Thank you, Marlene. And yes, I understand that you have heard about alkaline water too. So. Does it work? Now, I keep hearing about alkaline water, but mostly from social media and advertising, actually. There are several celebrities and influencers endorsing alkaline water, and mostly the pricey water ionizer machines that can be found in many stores. However, wait a moment before you run out and buy one. Alkaline water is water that has been altered to increase its pH to more than 7.0. This is supposed to work in the same way sodium bicarbonate works. It should make your body less acidic and help with the complications of kidney disease. Now, the problem is that contrary to what happens with baking soda, which has been studied thoroughly and is prescribed by nephrologists to patients that need it, there is no clear data showing us that alkaline water works in making the blood more alkaline, alright? And it's true that the modern American diet is high in animal proteins and processed foods and this can create a significant acid load, especially dangerous for kidney disease patients. But will alkaline water solve this problem? We don't know, and I don't think it will actually, but that's just my opinion. And that's all you're going to have about these opinions until someone decides to test alkalizing water on kidney patients. Now, the best way to reduce acid load is to eat plenty of plant-based foods like fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Actually, I've made a video about this topic. Another comment. This one is from Clelia Ibello. Why not legumes at stage 3? Can they be leached? If so, how? I am Italian and love my legumes. Any suggestion? Hello, Clelia. Thank you, and I love legumes too. The problem is that they have too much phosphorus, and phosphorus intake is already restricted in stage 3 because in stage 3, the kidneys cannot remove a lot of phosphorus, so the body binds it with calcium to excrete it. Where does it get this calcium? From the bones. And that's a problem because this process will make them brittle. Now, some patients get prescribed medications to solve this issue, but if you can get less phosphorus from the diet and avoid the medications, it's better. What about legumes? You cannot leach legumes. But fortunately, not all of them are too rich in phosphorus for a real diet. Yes, the good news is that you can still eat some of them. You can eat green beans, fava beans, green peas, garbanzo beans, 
but even other beans like navy beans could be consumed once in a while, okay? This is because research suggests only about 50% of phosphorus is absorbed in legumes. Just don't forget to rinse them thoroughly if you're eating canned legumes so you'll get rid of the sodium they're packaged with. Okay, this was our last one for today and as I was saying, I want to make this segment where I answer your comments a regular part of my videos, okay? So ask anything you want and if it's interesting for the other subscribers too, I'll answer in my next video. For now, I want to say thank you to all of you guys for watching me today and I hope you enjoyed this video. See you next time, bye!